It's now my honor and privilege to welcome our commencement speaker for today, Kevin Alui. Kevin, um, Kevin is CEO and co-founder of a company called Gojek. How many people in the audience have heard of Gojek? Okay, I think many more of you will learn about Gojek in the years ahead. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the company through Kevin's personal story. He graduated from Marshall not very long ago in 2009, having focused when he was here uh, in corporate finance, entrepreneurship, and international relations. Uh, he worked for a bunch of interesting companies in his native Indonesia before founding Gojek in 2014. But as he was telling me the other night, life throws you curveballs and you have to do something with it. Graduating in 2009, this is ancient history I know for everyone uh, on the floor today, but 2009 was not a great year to be graduating with a business degree. Um, Kevin turned those lemons into lemonade big time, uh, co-founding Gojek in 2014. Gojek began its life as a two-wheel, that's motorbike, rideshare and delivery platform in his native Indonesia. Today, it is one of Southeast Asia's biggest super apps, combining more than 20 on-demand services with a full suite of mobile payments and digital wallets. And I, I think for everybody who lives in the US, what you've got to understand about Gojek is it's an end-to-end -end super app that does so much more than any of the individual apps that we use uh, every day in the United States. And Gojek's success means that uh, now it has hundreds of millions, literally, of active users throughout Southeast Asia. Um, let's talk money for a second. Gojek was Indonesia's first decacorn. That's a unicorn times 10. That is a startup valued at over $10 billion. The investors in Gojek are literally a uh, who's who of global tech and finance giants from Google and Facebook in the US to Tencent in China, from Singapore's sovereign wealth fund to Masek to the iconic venture capital company Sequoia and equally iconic private equity firm KKR. In 2021, Gojek moved with an um, merged with an e-commerce platform called Tokopedia to create a new company called, spelt GoTo, but pronounced GoTo. GoTo IPA'd in, uh, IPA'd. <laughs> That's a Freudian slip. GoTo IPO'd in Indonesia last month with a valuation of $30 billion. For his incredible achievements in Gojek, Kevin was named first one of Forbes 30 for 30 under 30 in Asia in 2016. And earlier this year, he was named to a Forbes Indonesia 40 under 40. Last but not least, Kevin's a proud graduate of the Marshall School. Can you please join me in welcoming Kevin to the podium? Wow, this is very different than most of my Zoom speeches. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, thank you so much, Dean Garrett, for the kind words. Most of all, thank you to the graduates of USC's Marshall School of Business undergraduate class of 22 for inviting me, an Indonesian guy you probably have never heard of, back to campus to help celebrate your graduation. I'm honored to be with you today and very proud to call you my alumni. Congratulations to the parents, to the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, siblings, to all who've become part of the support ecosystem, contributing time, effort, and very often cold hard cash over two decades to help each member of this class arrive at this hopefully now employable moment. I speak from experience. We would be nothing without you. After Dean Garrett invited me to speak today, I began to wonder if I could stand at this podium look out on the class of 22 and find some version of myself staring back at me. I don't see a me among you, but on the off chance, one, 
A few, many of you are better at hiding the fear I felt when I sat where you did, literally in this building. You all look so confident. And I thought I might share some thoughts I could have used back then. As diligently researched and as kind as Dean Garrett's words were, I was almost uncomfortable hearing them because I'm suspicious of success stories. I know that might sound absurd because we all heard those big numbers about Gojek, and obviously I wouldn't be here if success wasn't part of the story. But those numbers and all that they entail are actually a relatively new feature of the past 13 years of my life. And while they're directly correlated with why I'm up here talking to you, they certainly don't make me feel like I should be up here. They don't make me feel like I should be up here talking to you. Success stories are problematic because their focus you know, tends to be a little data driven. It's not easy to take big numbers or sensational media articles and look deep enough to see the human story in them. It's much easier to create some narrative of specialness around the idea of a figurehead responsible for all the success. But, only, but not only are those human stories always present and always of greater importance than any success narrative allows in the frame, they're also an important reminder that all products, all companies, ideas, and institutions owe everything to the deeply flawed and generally normal human beings who create and steward them. If any of these distinguished faculty and administrators behind me happened to look out on the graduates 13 years ago, not a single one of them would have spotted me in the crowd and said, hey, that guy right there, mark my words, in 13 years, he'll be back here speaking on this stage. Even my mother, who's here today, my mom, uh, and my father, uh, who's watching on the live stream in Indonesia right now, two people who are very guilty of being these biased supporters of mine, would have gotten a good laugh at that idea. And I get it, I get it. The vibe that I was channeling that day was defined more by fear than by promise. At some point during my teenage years, probably while I was playing video games, my father loudly suggested I consider a career in finance. It was a massive, growing, important industry, and all the smartest and most successful people were in it. I bet he was also attracted to the financial freedom my independence would create for him. <laughs> with that, I came up with a plan for success. Get into a top undergrad business school in the US, get a job at one of the big investment banks, transition to private equity or a hedge fund, profit. Pretty straightforward, right? Wrong. Because in the four years between the time I left Jakarta and found myself seated here in cap and gown, the plan fell apart. At graduation, when I tried to peer ahead of myself into the future, there wasn't anything waiting for me. I'd accomplished step one of my plan, getting into a top undergraduate business school, but step two hadn't even come close to fruition. I wasn't on my way to an analyst position at a bulge bracket investment bank. In fact, I hadn't landed any job offers. Admittedly, you know, it was 2009, as Dean Garrett mentioned, so the global financial crisis played some role in that. And, a few, and the few companies that were hiring, if we're being honest, were being completely unfair. They only took the great promising candidates, you know, the ones who didn't begin their term papers the night before they were due. And, you know, fun fact, that hasn't changed. I just finished writing this speech last night. <laughs> anyway, I was in trouble. So I look up our internal list of alumni working in finance, and after four years of procrastination boot camp at SC, I was an expert at grinding through work. So I spent the next three weeks throwing passion, energy, and desperation at every Marshall grad I could. I literally sent 5,000 emails over 20 days. That outreach, <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Um, that outreach generated a couple hundred responses, about 15 phone calls, two interviews, and zero job offers. When I went looking for an audience for my tale of woe, one of my favorite people at Marshall, Professor Julia Plotz, shout out to Professor Plotz. You know, I know she has a lot of fans in the audience. She wasn't only willing to listen, she soon stuck her neck out for me with a small business valuation firm and they actually hired me. I was elated. I worked hard while continuing to look for an investment banking job that I was certain would quiet the devil on my shoulder that kept whispering, this isn't for you, and solve all my problems. Except then I did get an investment banking job, and I spent a year grinding there, doing the work, convincing myself that I liked the job that I practically made a part of my identity for years. 
I burned the candle at both ends, but my peers surpassed me, and I began to realize that some of them liked the work for the work's sake, no convincing required. So I did one of the hardest things I'd done to date, and I admitted to myself and my family and my friends that the story of a future I'd wanted wasn't going to be mine, because I didn't want it, and frankly, I wasn't very good at it. For a very long time, that was a really hard thing for me to say, because I didn't leave that job in a blaze of glory. I left absolutely terrified that there might not be a place for me, that maybe I didn't deserve one, just like the way I felt at graduation two years prior. The fact that things have worked out for me in other areas obviously makes it easier to discuss all of this stuff now. And I don't talk about it much in public. In fact, I don't talk about it much at all. But I think it's really important to share today. As I went back to Indonesia to break into its nascent technology industry in 2011, I didn't leave those feelings behind. That feeling of not being good enough and not having a place haunted me for a while. And when I started Gojek with my co-founders, I was quickly educated on just how many varieties of not good enough there are on the market. A new company needs investors not charming enough, not credentialed enough. You need to develop and build products and services not smart enough, not experienced enough. When we launch our app in 2015, for the next 12 months, our orders doubled every month. Our systems and our organization were barely able to keep up. Things were bursting at the seams. Growing too fast is a great problem to have, but still a problem that's destroyed many companies. Now, the other side of that coin, crazy growth meant the business was always hungry for more capital, resulting in moments like once being literally hours, hours away from running out of money. I found that when you scale, everything scales. The good, the bad, the perks, the problems. But the only thing that remains constant, that has the same gravity to it, is that feeling, that feeling of dread when you encounter new challenges at a new scale. Over the years, I've realized that rarely does growth feel like growth, but dread is easy to see coming once you know what you're looking for, and you should be comfortable with that. Class of 22, I wish you so much luck in the larger world, but determination too. Whether you're leaving Marshall to begin your dream job, or you have no idea what your dream job might even be, more than anything, I wish you growth. I can't think of a better way to fight on. Thank you, and congratulations, class of 22. It's It's been an absolute honor to, for me to speak for you today, and my comms team would like me to make some social media content, so I'm going to take a selfie with all of you. <laughs> make some noise, class of 22. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kevin. Um, I haven't combed the historical records, but I think it's likely that Kevin is the youngest or certainly one of the youngest uh, commencement speakers we've ever had at Marshall. But I know he's the first one to have shown up to a celebration speech wearing lime green Nikes. <laughs> I don't know whether, can you show your shoes? This is a true, I'm not making this up. You can't make that up. Okay, 